Alhamdulillah, I have throughout my life offered many da'wah training sessions where I teach people how to talk about Islam. And I've done this in many different cities. And one of the basic things, first things you tell people is how to establish the foundation. Everybody should know this. You need to explain, Tawheed, God is one. All-powerful, unseen creator. Obvious. Tawheed. Then, Nubuwa. This creator, what does he do? He sends guidance through books and messengers. Right? And then the last point is what? Akhirah. Which is answering the question, why do I care? If there's a God, if there's prophets, if there's guidance, if there's books, why do I care? Because you're going to die. And you're going to be resurrected and you're going to be judged. Was I someone who sought out the truth? Did I seek after guidance? Or was I someone who neglected it, soaked in all the blessings and couldn't care less where they came from? What type of person are you? This is the basics of da'wah. Everybody should know. Tawheed, nubuwa, akhirah, just as a foundation. You could even summarize this stuff in two, three minutes. One minute, two, three minutes, whatever. After many years of teaching, having classes, teaching people how to give da'wah, I'd like to share with you what I consider to be one of the most important and the most consistent observations about the way Muslims give da'wah and where they are deficient. There is a very clear and obvious deficiency that seems to creep up every single time. And if I could summarize that in one word, that word would be impersonal. Impersonal. It doesn't matter what city I've taught in. It doesn't matter if I'm teaching people that are young or old, male or female. It doesn't matter what their country of origin was. In general, it seems that Muslims are averse. It's like they have this allergic reaction to the words I or me or my, and I don't know why. So I'd like for us to talk about it. Recently, I was in one of our da'wah training classes. Alhamdulillah, and I hope anybody who was there, please don't feel like I'm picking on you. Like I said, this happens a lot. So you're not the only ones, so please don't be offended. <laughs> but just because it's so fresh in my mind, what took place? I said, okay, let's train ourselves. Let's practice a little bit of writing, a little bit of creative writing here on your phones, and then tell me a few paragraphs. So we're gonna start with what? They ask you, what is Islam all about? You say, starting number one is Tawheed. So, and by the way, these are not children I'm talking about. I'm talking about adults, so I'm not picking on like kids or something. <laughs> so, I ask, what are you going to say to this non-Muslim? And they say, well, Islam teaches that there is one God, that he is the creator, the sustainer of the universe, and they go on and on. I say, mashallah, everything you said is good. Everything you said is true. However, I want you to try to make it personal. I'll give you an example. Maybe I would say something like the following. I'd say, as a Muslim, I believe that Allah is my creator. He is the one who fashioned me and gave me every opportunity that I have and every loving relationship that I've ever had and every faculty that I use on a daily basis. Allah is at the center of my life and I'm grateful for his generosity. This is why I begin my day washing up and praying to Allah. And then throughout my day, I continue to pray to him, call upon him when I am in need, knowing that he's going to respond to me. And I repent to him when I fall short, knowing that he is all forgiving and all merciful. Now, I'm sure you can all observe what I did there. Notice how I remained faithful to the asma Allah wa sifatihi, his names and attributes. I didn't say them in Arabic. I said them indirectly. But you can see there's a reference to Allah being the creator, al-khaliq, his generosity, al-kareem, he's the source of love, al-wadud, he is the responsive, al-mujib, he's the forgiving, Al-Ghafoor. So I'm being faithful to what the Quran describes about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet at the same time, I did so while personalizing it. Talking about me, my, I. So I want you to imagine. I'm back in class. This is just not even a week ago. And I'm trying to explain this to them. I say, you guys get what I'm talking about? Good stuff. Okay, now let's move on. I said, let's move on. Now that we've explained just a paragraph or two about Allah being one, now let's move on to how he interacts with humanity by sending us guidance through books and messengers. And I want each and every single one of you to explain this concept of nubuwa. And please feel free, go into your mind, go into your heart, find a verse of the Quran that has inspired you. Think about a particular hadith that has impacted you. Please find a story from the life of the Prophet in his seerah, in his biography, something that has touched you. Let's hear what you got. Time for some creative writing. Yalla, let's go for it. Somebody raises their hand. They say, the Prophet ﷺ has the best of character. He is exemplary in the way he spoke, in how he led the believers, what he taught. He is the greatest role model, showcasing patience, 
persistence, kindness, and compassion. He transformed his people, taking from them from the darkness of shirk and kufr and disbelief, took them from darkness to light. And this light of Islam continues to spread around the world, benefiting humanity, I said, mashallah. Beautiful, well said. However, I do have one comment. You still never said the word I or me. You just avoided that word. So please, let's try. I'll give you guys an example. So I'm telling the classroom, I'm saying, listen, if I'm speaking to a non-Muslim, after I've described the oneness of God, now I want to transition to this idea that Allah Ta'ala sends guidance through books and messengers, this concept of nubuwa, I might say something like this. I might say, growing up, I saw everybody around me looking up to different role models. Each kid is trying to be like some singer, some sports star, some actor. And I quickly realized that human nature is to look up to somebody else, which is why our creator sent us role models, prophets and messengers who taught us how to be the very best versions of ourselves. And as for me, Alhamdulillah, the Prophet ﷺ has taught me so many lessons throughout my life. I'm just gonna give you one, a few examples regarding what? Regarding speech, Reg regarding uh, one aspect of life, which is how to talk. SubhanAllah, I, I learned from the Prophet ﷺ the power of speech, how important it is, and how a big of an effect it can have when the Prophet ﷺ told us what? that truthfulness is going to lead you to good character. Just speak the truth, and it's gonna lead you to better and better character. And better character is gonna lead you to what? To paradise. Inna sidqa yahdi ilal birr, wa inna al birra yahdi ilal jannah. Beautiful hadith. The Prophet ﷺ taught me, personally, what? That either say something good or be silent. فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ If you're gonna say something, make sure it's good. If you have nothing good to say, keep it to yourself. What a powerful lesson that has affected me in terms of my speech. And what else? The Prophet ﷺ taught me something important. To speak the truth, even if it's bitter. Speak the truth, even if it's bitter. These are certain aspects, certain things that I have personally learned that have touched me and I think are so powerful. I say, everybody gets the point? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay, let's move on. Now that we've introduced this concept that God is one, now that we've given a paragraph or two, something brief, about how Allah sends guidance. Let's talk about the Akhirah. Who would like to talk about the Akhirah? Somebody raises their hand. And they say, why wouldn't you want to go to paradise? Why wouldn't you want to be with the believers, the righteous, the prophets? Why wouldn't you want to be in bliss eternally? Why wouldn't you want to be with your Lord? And on and on, and I'm sitting, and I'm waiting, and I'm listening. I'm like, SubhanAllah, every time, in this city, in another city, in another city, and I just go, at this point, I just, I walk up to the board, the, the whiteboard, I grab the dry erase marker, and in a big I, I, say it, say I, say me, please say it. And they're like, right, 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 sorry, 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 we forgot, we forgot. SubhanAllah, over and over again, it seems no matter how many times you try to hammer this home, Muslims have this difficulty to make it personal. Talk about me, my perspective. Say, I know that I'm going to die one day and I don't know when I'm going to die. I could have a heart attack in the next five minutes. I could get hit by a bus. I am going to have to face that reality. But when I do, I hope that I'll be able to meet my creator and say, I tried. At least I gave it a shot. I wanna be able to say that, don't you? I want to join the righteous in paradise. I want to taste the fruits of paradise. I want to see the palaces of Jannah. I want to finally be done with this test. I want to pass this test and I wanna be of one of the people who Allah loves. This is what I want. Can you guys talk like this? And SubhanAllah, over and over and over again. I'm telling you, this was an hour and a half class. And I just keep repeating. This is just not even a couple days ago. And yet, SubhanAllah, so much difficulty that Muslims have in saying, I, me, my. Now, the big question is why? Why do Muslims avoid personalization? And I think it's rooted in something good. Even though it's a bit of a problem, it's a big problem, but it's rooted in something good. It's rooted in respect. I think most Muslims, we associate honor and respect and professionality with what? With impartiality, right? You think to yourself, I wanna be unbiased. If I'm talking about Islam, I have so much great respect for Islam, I'm not gonna start talking about my feelings. This is bigger than me. MashaAllah, that's a beautiful attitude. You have this deep respect for your deen. MashaAllah, tabarakAllah. I'm so glad that you have that respect. However, there is a way to combine professionality and passion. It can be done. It is not some impossible equation. You can 
be accurate and professional and direct while at the same time talking about your personal experience. We as human beings were created by Allah Ta'ala with what? With a head and a heart, both. It's not one or the other guys. You have a head and a heart. The head representing what? Being intellectual and professional and accurate and unbiased and factual. But at the same time, the heart is, respecting what? is, is representing what? Your feelings and your passion, your personal anecdotes. Both can be comp combined. I want to give you an example. Most people are familiar with the idea that if you want to try to demonstrate, try to prove the existence of a creator, you look at the creation. You say, look, look around you. You see so much design. There must be a designer. This is a very standard argument. It's known as the teleological argument. It's a philosophical argument that has been detailed in many books. So you can argue the teleological argument very professionally, but you can also make it personal and say, when I open my eyes and I have the ability to see, I have the ability to hear, I breathe in air, and I can eat food and digest, I have the ability to move, I have muscles and joints that function and I can move around, make choices and communicate with people. This is remarkable, remarkable design. So you're making the philosophical argument, which is very intellectual and professional, but you're also making it personal. You guys see the combination of both? It can be done. And we need to train ourselves at thinking in this way. Now, the big question is what? Why is it that the impersonal approach is problematic? And indeed, it is problematic. I'm sure there are many reasons. I'm only going to offer four reasons as to why this is so problematic. Inshallah, in the next khutbah, wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa 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 alayhi wa sallam. So the question, the fact that the impersonal approach seems to be the default. Muslims in Islam, Islam is a religion that believes in one God and prophets and afterlife and judgment day. Very impersonal. Is this a problem? I would say yes. I want to talk about four reasons as to why. Number one, one observation that I think is important. Alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah. We have been focusing a lot on interfaith. We have been bringing in different groups to talk to them about their religion. And everybody makes the same observations. Every time we sit down and have one of these dinners, people make the same observation, which is what? That it seems that these Christians do a very good job of focusing on their personal relationship with their faith. They do a very good job at it. Sometimes to the point where it, it seems odd that you're asking them a question about why does the Bible say this? Or, or what do you say about this verse? Or how do you believe this? And can you explain to me your, your beliefs? Or whatever the case is. And they say, I want to tell you something. When I was younger, I was lost. I was in darkness. You know, I was a person who was just selfish, just looking after my own desires. And they tell this long story about what? About their personal transformative journey. And it's very beautiful, it's very nice that they went through this whole journey and that they're a better person. Okay, I grant them all that. But they kind of, at the end of it, you're like, well, what about my question? You know, I was talking about the beliefs here. Sometimes they go, it seems like the Muslims just want to focus on the head and they just want to focus on the heart and there's like a gap between us. It's very bizarre. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is that we need to combine both. Why? Because we have to copy them? No. Somebody might object and say, brother, why do we have to copy what they do? We have our own methodology. Why do we, we don't need to copy them. You're absolutely right. We don't have to copy them. We have to learn from the Qur'an. This is point number two. Very important point. The Qur'an teaches us something extremely important about da'wah. Through the Prophet who seems to have the most da'wah techniques shown in the Qur'an through him. And who is that Prophet? And Allah knows best. To me, it seems that Ibrahim is the Prophet who doesn't just give da'wah to his father, he also gives, you know, personal family, also gives da'wah to who? To his people. He doesn't just give da'wah to the people who worship idols. He also gives da'wah to the one who calls himself a god, a king. He also gives da'wah to the people who worship the stars. He gives da'wah in so many different techniques. And in each one, there's lessons to be, to be learned. So subhanAllah, this Qur'an is teaching us so many techniques from Ibrahim alayhi salam. Let's pay attention to what Ibrahim alayhi salam says when he's speaking to the idolaters. And I want you to notice something, inshaAllah. This is not about copying any non-Muslim. This is about us going back to our Qur'an and learning from our Prophet, the Sunnah of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He says what? فَإِنَّهُمْ عَدُوٌ لِي إِلَّا رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ الَّذِي خَلَقَنِي فَهُوَ يَهْدِينَ وَالَّذِي هُوَ يُطْعِمُنِي وَيَسْقِينَ وَإِذَا مَرِدْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ وَالَّذِي يُمِيتُنِي ثُمَّ يُحْيِينَ وَالَّذِي أَطْمَعُ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ لِي خَطِيئَةِ يَوْمَ الدِّينَ رَبِّ هَبْ لِي حُكْمًا وَأَلْحِقْنِي بِالصَّالِحِينَ وَاجْعَلْ لِي لِسَانَ صِدْقٍ فِي الْآخِرِينَ وَاجْعَلْنِي مِنْ وَرَثَةِ جَنَّةِ النَّعِيمِ 
Those of you who speak Arabic, I think you got the point. But if you didn't, no, if you don't speak Arabic, listen to the English in Shalatada. He's telling these idolaters about their idols. He says what? Indeed, they are enemies to me, except the Lord of the worlds. He he's the one who created me and he guides me. He is the one who feeds me and gives me to drink. And when I am sick, he is the one who cures me. And he's the one who's going to cause me to die, and then he's going to bring me back to life. And I aspire that he will forgive me of my sins on the day of judgment. My Lord, grant me authority and join me with the righteous and grant me a reputation of honor among later generations and place me among the inheritors of the gardens of pleasure. Please tell me you caught the commonality, the theme. What was the theme? It's obvious. Me. It's personal. It's personal. And when I see that Muslims are so bad at this, I promise you, not once, not twice, consistently across the board, Muslims are very bad at making it personal, and we need to improve. We need to work on it. And when we have non-Muslims coming and visiting us, and they're doing a better job of implementing the sunnah of Ibrahim salam, at that point I say, enough is enough. This is getting ridiculous. We need to train ourselves to what? Speak about our deen personally. So point number one is that non-Muslims are implementing this. Point number two is that this is a Quranic technique. Point number three is what? If you can't, if we cannot personalize our Islam when we talk about our deen, then our children will think that Islam is just a set of rules that they don't necessarily understand and that they aren't personally invested in. They will conclude that they're never gonna feel any passion about Islam. Why? Because mom and dad have been practicing Islam their whole lives. I've seen mom and dad practicing, praying every prayer, and yet whenever I talk to them about Islam, I have never heard them say I or me or my, not even one time. So what's the point? There's no love, there's no passion. This isn't going to benefit me. This is not gonna be something deep. This is just something that's a set of rules. It's very dry and I'm not interested. And point number four, if that's not enough, I want you all to pay attention to just how personally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the believers. How directly Allah ta'ala speaks to the believers. I'm only going to give two examples. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about why he created us, does Allah say humans were created to worship Allah? No. Allah ta'ala says what? وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah ta'ala speaks so personally. I have not created jinn or man except to worship me. Personal language. Saying what? You know why I made you? I made you so that we can have a personal relationship. The whole reason you exist is so that you can be mine. Not his, third person, personal relationship. If that's not enough for you, we all know the month of Ramadan is soon approaching, inshallah. Allah Ta'ala speaks about Ramadan throughout the Quran in different places. In one place in particular, you find in Surah Baqarah two ayat, and with one ayat in between. It's very interesting. Ayah number 185 and 187 are both about Ramadan. And then in the middle, you have one ayah about dua, which really tells you what? That during the month of Ramadan, a key focus is dua. What is that ayah? Let's pay attention. Allah Ta'ala says what? And when my servants ask you, Concerning me, indeed, I am near. I respond to the invocation of the supplicant when he calls upon me. So let them respond to me and believe in me that they may be rightly guided. Seven times in one single ayah. This is how personal Allah Ta'ala speaks when it comes to your dua. And the Muslim is saying, we believe as Muslims that there is one God and God created humanity and sent prophets and that Muslims, they pray and that there's going to be death and then resurrection, heaven and hell. Very impersonal. Consistently, consistently. Where is the passion? Where is the personal? In conclusion, final few points, there's a well-known Arabic proverb. فَاقِدُ الشَّيْءِ لَا يُعْطِي Everybody knows what this means. Well, most people know what this means. It means what? You can't give what you don't have. If you don't got something, you can't give it. You can't give what you don't have. If you don't have the passion, you will not be able to convey it to anybody, obviously. Ramadan is soon approaching, correct? Ramadan is a time of personal spiritual growth. It's not about food. 
Ramadan is not about hanging out. Ramadan is not about posting on social media. Ramadan, I'll say again, is about personal spiritual growth. Key word here being personal. If Ramadan comes and goes, and at the end of Ramadan, I go up to 10 random people, and I ask them, after this whole month of the Qur'an, please tell me what is amazing about the Qur'an, and they all have the exact same cookie-cutter answer. And they all say, the Qur'an is miraculous because it has, says things inside of it that could not be predicted by somebody that lived 1400 years ago. Exact same thing, 10 different people. La ilaha illallah. Are you kidding me? Cookie cutter, standard procedure, nothing personal whatsoever. That I would consider to be a failure. So the question is, what is going to be your focus this month? Of Ramadan. How are you going to prepare for it? Are you going to treat the Qur'an this month as something you just need to read through quickly? Just quickly read the ayat, don't understand it, don't care, just burn through it so you can finish it? Or are you going to actually enjoy and study and think and reflect and talk about this Qur'an like it is comprised of 114 love letters from the creator of the universe to you personally? Is that the way you're going to treat the Qur'an? Because if you do, and then I ask that same question to 10 different people, I should get 10 different answers. What's amazing about the Qur'an? Oh, brother, I was reading Surah Anbiya, subhanAllah. One ayah blew my mind. The other guy says, oh, subhanAllah, Surah Zuhuf, something about it. This whole section, I, it just really shocked me. That's what I want to hear. I want to hear different opinions from different people, inshaAllah ta'ala. Final point, inshaAllah, I know that we're all concerned about Palestine, what's taking place overseas. Of course, everybody's angry, everybody's sad, everybody's hurting. I have to remind all of us that just being angry and just being sad is not enough. Just, I don't know, punching the wall and, I cried this many times, how many times have you cried? SubhanAllah, is this, is this what we're doing? We have to have a little bit more of an approach, a, a mature approach, inshallah ta'ala. So, there's two main things. Number one is what? Get up and physically go over there and try to help those who are suffering, those who are in pain. I don't know how you're gonna do that, the borders are shut down, and if you were that person, then you wouldn't be listening to me right now. You already would've been up and out of here, so it doesn't apply. However, there's a second approach, which is what? You stay here and you try to help them on an intellectual basis. Yes, the first one is more immediate, and the second one is more long-term, but it's still effective, and there is still weight to trying, having, making the attempt to what? To affect people influencing people, influencing hearts and minds. Now, if you want to take that second approach and you want to be effective in influencing hearts and minds, well then, I'm trying to give you the tools on how to do it. I'm trying to tell you what I have consistently observed wherever I go. I'm trying to teach you what we're missing according to the Qur'an, not according to me, according to the Qur'anic technique taught by Ibrahim salam. So we make dua, Ya Allah, make us passionate about Islam. Ya Allah, teach us to practice Islam with passion and talk about Islam with passion and teach our children about Islam with passion, making it personal and unique to ourselves. Ya Allah, make us followers of our Prophet Ibrahim salam in all ways that he called people to Islam, especially making Islam something deeply personal. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt, wa aafina fi man aafayt, wa tawallana fi man tawallayt, wa barik lana fi ma aatayt, wa khina sharra ma qadayt, fa innaka taqdi wa la yuqda alayk, innahu la yadhillu man walayt, wa la ya'izzu man aadayt, barakta rabbana wa ta'alayt, rabbana aatina fi dunya hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana, wa qina adhaab al-nar, wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, sallam kathira wa aqim al-salah. We have a janazah, salat al-janazah, right after salah, so don't run away too quick.